Hey, good afternoon. It's, it's been a little bit since I've done an, an interview with somebody. It's been a couple of weeks because of my travel. I seem to be having these long weekend events that I go to, but we're here. I'm here with Dr. Carmel. She and I met in a mutual like business mentorship program and we got to know one another and we do completely different things. And so we were both intrigued with what each other does. We just invited each other to come and speak and share what we know about our particular things and how they interrelate and do they interrelate. So Dr. Carmel, welcome to uh, this discussion um, with Foundations and Wellness. So Dr. Carmel, tell me what you specialize in. Absolutely. Thank you. So my passion is helping couples to get ready to have the most optimal and healthy pregnancy possible for them so that they can have a safe, easy birth and have healthy children. I love that. And in life is just transforming how we create human beings, how we create children so that they thrive. Yeah, I love that. As a mother of five and a grandmother of nine, almost 10, well, she's on the way. I just haven't met her yet. We will meet her in two months. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I had a bunch of my babies at home. And so birthing, pregnancy, childbirth, I thought I was going to be a midwife. That's how close it is to my heart. Um, The Lord had other plans, but this is why I just love this topic. So one of the things that I am curious, I wanted to know is when people come to you and they have this need, how often do you see Or do you have people come to you that have existing autoimmune conditions or is that a thing? You know, mainly I have people come that are having challenges, get either getting pregnant or staying pregnant. And um, a lot of times I'm the one that has the suspicion that maybe they're dealing with an autoimmune condition. Maybe nobody's ever uh, looked under that rock. As I would say, I like to look under all the rocks and see what we have going on. I may be the first person that look that has looked under that rock. It's it's actually pretty rare that I have somebody who's come and say, all right, I have this autoimmune condition and you know, what do I do now? It's usually me that, that discovers it through advanced testing. So it's, it's so not uncommon, like just getting, well, the challenge that you and I both know is there's not a whole lot that we can say we can do and say this is an autoimmune test you know there's a couple things right we can do celiac testing we can test an ana for like um connective tissue kind of things we can do a rheumatoid factor but like there's a lot of autoimmune that kind of falls in that gray misty area where it's sort of a process of elimination that we realize that this is what's happening and including with, you know, the, what I dealt with, I, all my labs look fine, you know, but I wasn't fine. And so it was somebody who finally said, this is what's going on, gave it a name, called it fibromyalgia, called it chronic fatigue. And it was caused by X, Y, Z, a bunch of different things, different exposure, pathogens, all that stuff, bugs that I had get, you know gotten exposed to and was sick with, but it's not uncommon to have, I, I have found for people to go completely undiagnosed. If you, if you don't do, you call it uncovering the rocks. I call it super sleuthing. We both do the same thing. We're like, where can we find what's going on? Right. (laughs) So, so what do you do? What is your first, like, what's the first thing that raises your suspicion when it comes to that? How do you kind of get, draw that conclusion? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I think I first start to have the suspicion when in the initial consultation, when a patient has filled out their very long health history. (laughs) Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I work with both the, the female and the guys because, you know, we, Oh, my camera likes these hand signals that I'm, Oh, you're giving it. It's showing the hands up. I'm doing (laughs) I, I actually work with both. I interview both. I get both their health histories because there is a rising body of uh, research that is pointing to the contribution that the guy has in the success of the pregnancy or, you know, subsequent miscarriage or the success. And um, so I'm interviewing both of them. And so I'm 
hearing all about not only just their symptoms, but I'm also hearing about their past exposures to, to chemicals, to heavy metals, and then how they respond to certain things, the levels of stress that they're dealing with, and then how they respond to that, right? So if I see somebody who has been exposed to a lot of stress, but they exhibit a lot of resilience, for example, I'm like, okay, they're, they're actually coping well, but for somebody else, if just a little bit of stress that might just put them over the edge, that unexplained fatigue, <laughs> some of the cases I, I find amazing that other professionals haven't tested because they were like, really, obviously, like, for yeah. example, one lady who had been already had an ultrasound and had nodules on her, her thyroid. Okay. Wow. And I said, well, if they looked at your thyroid antibodies. Well, no. I said, well, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> let's do that, right? Let's yeah. let, let's look at that. So some of them are more obvious. <laughs> I will yeah, say it seems obvious to you and I, maybe. <laughs> it seems obvious, like, huh, yeah. I wonder why there's, you know, why there might be nodules there. Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's look and see what what's what's going on. What's your body doing here? So uh, let me think of if there's any other ones. Well, I, I will tell you if somebody comes and has uh, recurrent miscarriages, it is something that, that red, raises a red flag. And it is something that I want to, in my mind, either rule in or rule out. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's amazing. And I love the fact that, you know, I, I will say for, thousands of years, probably if there's, if there's a lack of ability to get pregnant or if there's a miscarriage, the woman was to blame, right. Yes. Or, or if we don't produce a boy, right. If the, if the male offspring was the desired outcome and that's not what happened. Oh, what did you do? Except that now we know it has nothing to do with us. Right. And so I love that you're looking at the man too, because for sure there, I mean, all the things that he could be exposed to that are affecting his, you know, testosterone, his sperm count, all the things stress can lower his, his sperm production and lower his testosterone, all that stuff. So I love that you're looking at the, at the man and not the woman and that it's a, you know, like what we do is holistic. Like we think spirit, soul, body, that kind of holistic, but it's also, you know, this big global picture of everybody that's involved with, what's going on. And that includes if, if there's two things that need to happen for a baby, it's a, it's a donor from a, a man and a donor from a woman, then we have to look at both. So I love that you're doing that. So Absolutely. when you have, um, do you, how are you managing the autoimmune or do you kind of work in collaboration with someone else? What do you, how do you do that? What do you, what's your process? I do. If we discover that there is autoimmune issues and um, at some point I will involve another provider because that's not an area that I have tons of experience in. And, and if, if it's, if it's a pretty simple, like maybe we're just starting to get to, um, it, maybe it's not full blown, but we're edging that way. I start to see the, um, antibodies, let's say like the thyroid antibodies starting to creep up as we look at it every three months, I'll take that on. Yeah. Uh, again, if it's, if it's something that's in the hundreds and, and I recently had a patient like this, who, who was not a fertility patient, but those markers were so high. And I said, okay, this is a case that I'm going to collaborate with a colleague who works just on with autoimmune patients. So yes. When you, you know, uncover that rock and you find that that's what's going on, you have your collaborative conversation how much of what needs to be done can be done consec, you know, like at the same time consecutively, or do you, do you have to like pause with one thing, address something and then come back? Like, or is it kind of just very individualized and it's different every time? I think it's really very different every single time, because again, it depends um, on a number of factors. Some of them not at all being not being health or medical related, some of them are economic issues. Like, do they, and I will say, I do run a test 
that it's called AMH. And it's a test of ovarian reserve. And I don't really use it to determine if a woman has enough eggs, right? I, it, it's a little tricky in that, but I do use it to determine how quickly we need to go. So let's say if we have a woman whose ovarian reserve is on the low side, then I might recommend like, hey, while you're doing this other stuff, let's go ahead and work on these other things just so we're doing it. And the second part is that, do they have the capacity, right? The bandwidth to work on multiple things. Is that gonna just put them over the top and they feel like their whole life is just dedicated to, you know, taking supplements and taking care of their health. And for some people they're like, bring it on. And for some people it's like, I have to take little baby steps. So yeah. it's really cool. I, I find that very often the case, depending on what I uncover, you know, like for instance, I had a patient who came to me, it's been a year now. She, she had terrible eczema and dermatographia, meaning she could write her name on her skin. You know, that's how bad and nobody ever checked certain things. And I discovered that she was full on celiac and she had been this way for, and she was in her forties, years and years and years. So for her, that was such a blow. Like she had to take a moment and just come to grips with that. It meant completely changing her diet, completely changing everything about what she did, educating her on how to eat, educating her on what to put on her skin and, in you know, how, all everything, personal care products, cleaning products, all the things that we do to help remove the toxins from our environment. And she, she needed time. And, and then financially she, she just needed time to be able to clean out a refrigerator and buy all new food. And it was a, a, it was a huge financial investment too. So depending on that, I definitely have people that say, yeah, bring it on like you do. But I, I can imagine for some, especially when fertility is such a, like you're so emotionally invested anyway, right? Like, and probably by the time they come to someone like you, they've already seen people have told them that there was nothing to be done except for IVF, you know, but that's not, that didn't resonate with them and they wanted to try something different. So emotionally, I can imagine that they're just exhausted. Ready, tired, ready for an answer, you know, kind of, I don't know ready for something to be different sooner rather than later, you know? And some of them have come after failed IVFs. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Other, you know, other treatments like, like myself, you know, I went through this whole journey myself, which is what propelled me to want to help others. I tried everything because when you want to have a kid and you're not having a kid and you're not having a kid and you're still not having a kid and everybody around you is having a kid, it's heartbreaking. You're, yeah, you are. And you're willing to do a lot and you don't always have the capacity. Yeah. To do you yeah. don't have the capacity to do a lot always. So you really have to go with what they can handle. So I am in what I do with, with my patients, we'll start off everybody I don't want to say we start everybody kind of at the same place, but we all have kind of, I have the same kind of process, you know, we'll start it here and we'll do, you know, very similar testing. And then it, it becomes differentiated very quickly. And we'll do, phys, you know, we'll do the diet changes. We'll do the supplements protocols and the things like that, things to address what we found in the testing. And they could be doing everything right. And they still are like not getting the where that we want them to. I usually stop and go, okay, what's going on emotionally? What is your approach to something like that? Do you start there first? Do you start, you know, with the physical side of things? What do you do? I do. I look at, I really, even in the initial consultation, I, I look at all the, the elements. Now, when it comes to what to do for somewhere, I do create priorities and I recently had a patient who started two months ago and she knows she's got the emotional stuff to deal with and she's not able or willing to do so at this point. So I said, okay, well, let's just kind of put it 
you know, just aside for a moment, let's look at the other things, but know that this is impacting your outcomes of everything that you do. Yeah. We can, we can, we can just keep it over here on the side on, on the low burner. And then we can come back to it if the other stuff is not working or you're not getting the results that you want. Yeah. But you know, it's a, it's like a huge web. Everything impacts the other thing. All the time. Yeah. It's any kind of separations we make. It's like a human created separation because in reality, right. Everything impacts everything. If I, I use the analogy of an egg, if we are, you know, spirit, soul, and body, we're egg, shell, we're yolk. And when you crack it and you wrap it all, you know, like you whisk it up in a ball, in a bowl, and it all gets like scrambled, how are you going to separate that? Even to try to crack it open, you know, usually what I start off with, because my intake is quite long, like yours is, I'm sure, and it addresses some of those things. And I always have that. And I might offer some stress management things in the beginning. But it's like the deep dive. Okay, there's some trauma here. I think that we need to deal with. There's some things that you know. There's a, a brilliant book called "The Body Keeps the Score." You know, a lot of us have trauma, whether it's like a physical thing, like I was in a really bad car accident, or whether you know we were abused, or whether we fell down the stairs and broke every bone in our body, and now we can't even you know we have to live in a rancher because we can't. We're so afraid. You know, there's the all those things that could be anything. Or it could be perceived threats, but depending on how we hold on to them and are able to be what we were talking about before we started this conversation was how resilient is that person that comes to us? You know, how, how, what's their bounce back? You know, how quickly can they bounce back? And I, I yeah, think that's something that's really important. Yeah. Absolutely. So what do you, what do you do? What do you recommend for the emotional things? Um. I reckon, so similar to what you're saying on multiple levels, initially I'll give them some stress management techniques. I also really love, I recently got this little band, which is a, um, a vagal nerve stimulator. Oh, I've seen those. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually got one of those and they have different, um, frequencies, I guess, and how they stimulate and, um, what they do is they stimulate the vagal nerve and help people come down from that flight or flight sympathetic yeah. mode yeah. and come down into a parasympathetic mode because that's the space, that's the place yeah. where they do healing. Yeah. So I like that because I, it, I think if I could have all my patients pray or meditate or doing breathing exercises, that would be awesome. Some people just need something more passive to have that nerve yeah. stimulated yeah. externally. And most of the sessions are like four or five minutes. So I find that yeah. even the busiest of people, they, they can really, they can get that done. Yeah. So they can apply it with that. I've seen and that. Then, I had somebody come and do a demonstration in my office, this vagus nerve stimulator that was kind of like put it here on the close to the carotid and it kind of tugs a little bit and it does the same thing. I, I did a lecture a couple of weeks ago on the importance of this and balancing, you know, like if the tiger is always chasing us, we're not going to digest our food. Our immune system's going to say, okay, I'm going to take a rest now. Cause what do we, what do we need all that to have happening? Our hormones don't work because the tiger's chasing us. We got to get the heck out of Dodge, you know? So finding ways to stimulate the vagus nerve to balance that. So we're in that rest and digest peace and at ease. That's so important. Yeah. It, it absolutely is. We also call it feed and breed. Here you go. If that tiger's chasing you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I have one of my favorite things. I don't know if you've seen this is I have something called brain tap, which yes, I have that too. Oh I love my gosh. I love my brain tap dropped on the floor and it broke. And I just, I was heartbroken. So I had to get a new headset for myself, but I often recommend it to, to folks um, because it just does such a good job of balancing the brain, stimulating the vagus nerve, calming down the nervous system, and even just helping to release hidden traumas too. It can be really effective at that. Yes. Yeah. I love all these gadgets that really support us in, in doing those things. And then there's two other things that I recommend. 
One is that I'll refer people to my colleague who does neuroemotional technique. I know you do that as well. And yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, I studied that, but I don't see people in a brick and mortar practice. So I refer people to somebody who does locally. Yeah. yeah. And um, the other thing I recommend for people is a course that I did first 20 years ago. That's just been a complete game changer in my life. It was a, it's a three and a half day conversation about being a human and putting the past in the past. And that's called the Limerick Forum. And so I recommend that for my patients because I find for doing this kind of work in three and a half days, there's just nothing else on the planet like it that that's that effective and that so people can go to therapy and you know that's great too but that that's a longer process yeah Uh, over the course of you know my health history I've had I've tried so many different things NET was the thing that was like the big game changer for me I you know other things had helped a little bit that was a big game changer since I mostly do virtual, I don't get to do it as often. People have to come to me or I go to them sometimes. So I miss that because it's, so, or, or I just find somebody that is close to them and I just say, go, you know, go see them because it, it's so powerful. It's so amazing at how it just gets right to the heart of the issue and really helps to free the body up then that can do what it needs to do. And kind of, cause it's not focusing hidden attention. Like It's sort of like the CPU on our, you know, when you open up the task manager on your computer or on your phone, there's all these tasks running in the background. You're like, how in the world? You didn't know that, but it's taking up energy. And so it's like the task manager end task, end task, end task. Every time we take care of those things from our past that are still affecting us subconsciously. I love that analogy. That's so great. Cause I'm one of those people that has all those tabs open. Yeah. And we'll- I think I have open. like 30 open right now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. Our bandwidth is good enough to support that in this video. I don't know either. Oh my goodness. So we talked about the emotional things. If you could like pick one thing that a person could do in their diet and nutrition that would help support their hormones and fertility. What is it that you usually recommend? Where, what's your starting place there? Starting place as a generality is to get people to eat more colors of the rainbow organic vegetables, some fruit. And, you know, there was recently a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association where they looked at the impact of eating just three times a week, eating organic, not the whole week, just three times. And they saw such a significant difference in terms of the ability of those people in the study who just three times a week had organic food, their, their capacity, their fertility increased. Whereas the ones who ate no organic food none at all there's actually decreased yeah and it it's you know people say to me it's it's very expensive to buy organic and i say yes that is true and there are ways around it part of the some of the things i tell people there's some really easy things that you can do yourself i think herbs can become very very expensive And if you really get into flavorful cooking, you really want to use those herbs. Yeah. I'll tell you what, if you give me a bowl of regular rice, I'll be like, "Eh." but if you have a bunch of green herbs that's cooked up with it, I I don't know. I can eat that whole bowl because it's so flavorful. So I have people grow that. I have people join farm shares where it's much more affordable. Yeah. I always look for ways to support them. Even again, even if it's just three times a week that you're going to get that. Yeah. um, And I love that. I tell people, look at the environmental working group has the dirty dozen, the clean 15, you know, if you're going to choose definitely there's like apples, strawberries, green peppers, never, never, never tomatoes, never. Those are easy to grow. I have container gardens. I'm looking at my herbs out my window and we had tomatoes and peppers coming out the ear and, and lettuces and stuff. And all I did was containers. I didn't do anything in the ground. And that 
like, you know, there's so many things that you can do, like you said, to grow it at home and, and then, you know, like knowing the things that, okay, you know, maybe avocados, they don't get sprayed and they're not genetically modified, which is that, that was my next question. So in the article, was it the glyphosate or was the genetic modification that was the bigger deal or is it both? They they weren't looking at the genetically modified so um, just the glyphosate. They were looking just at the glyphosate or any other uh, any other herbicide. Yeah, any other herbicide. Yeah. Um, that's all they looked at in that study, but it was quite profound. I was like my thinking, you know, like what I know of all the articles that I've read is that glyphosate increases intestinal permeability, like, you know causes leaky gut. So anytime you do that, that's going to affect your immune system It's going to affect your hormones. So anything that we can do to protect our gut, I usually start in the gut. It's not where I end because I end up you know, going even deeper than that. But I look at diet, I look at their gut, the quality of their diet and, and then the quality of their gut lining. And, and I can tell a lot of that just with some typical blood testing, I can see what's going on. And I recommend pretty much the same thing, you know, eating the rainbow, all the beautiful phytonutrients. Every one of those colors is a different polyphenol that has like so many beautiful nutrients that they each hold the reds and the blues and the greens and the yellows and the oranges. And I, I love that. I'm a huge fan of feeding the microbiome. I, I often ask people when you choose a food, who are you feeding? Mm -hmm. Right. Are you feeding your emotions? Are you feeding your gut, your healthy bacteria in your gut? So different bacteria like different foods. So some of them, they really like sweet potatoes and some of them really like cabbage. And yeah. some of them, are, and so you got to feed all of them because you want to have a really diverse um, community in your gut. And yeah, they outnumber us. They, you better make them happy. <laughs> Last time I talked, there's like, 10 trillion human cells, there's 50 trillion bacteria in our microbiome and on our skin. And, and, the, and I will say too, this, the lecture that I'm thinking about the guy who was talking about the microbiome is like the, the things that make you crave the things that aren't as good for you are those yeah. bacteria that you want to starve and kill. It's your microbiome. That's, that's really like screaming from down below and saying, eat this stuff. That's really not help, helping you at all. It's not serving you to eat that. So I like that. Starve, starve the enemy, feed, feed the friends kind of thing. Yeah, so. that's great. Starve the enemy, feed the friends. We'll make yeah. them. Yeah, for sure. So when it comes to nutritional supplements, because that's what we do a lot in, in what we do in functional medicine is avoid the chemicals, i.e. the prescriptions, the singular, you know, because prescriptions are just one singularly isolated chemical. We try to use more nutraceuticals, things that give the body nutrients and cofactors that we need. What do you find to be, is it, is it nutritional deficiency? Is it things that we need to support hormone production? How, how does that play in there? What does that look like? Well, all of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite tests is really evaluating the nutritional status. Uh, I, I tell people you can be eating the best foods. Here's another you know level to it. You can be eating the best foods and you can still be deficient in them. And we want to know that yeah. because what that tells us, like if, for example, if you're eating a really diverse diet and very healthy and you're avoiding pesticides as much as possible, and we do this test and you're deficient and all these things like, huh? Well, what could be happening here is you may be eating it, but you're not digesting it properly to where it is able to convert into a usable form so that you can use it in your cells to, yeah. you know, to grow this new life within you. Yeah. So I have found thing. that to be true more often than not. I, I have, I'm thinking of someone I saw yesterday. She has a beautiful diet. She eats only organic and she can eat whatever she wants. She eats primarily vegetarian, but when she eats fish, it's wild caught. You know, she does, she does like, a, she's pristine. And the first time we did her nutritional assessment, I was like, oh my, that explains a whole lot of why your hair is falling out. Your nails are brittle and your skin is dry and you have heart palpitations. Cause look at your nutritional status. Something is not, you know, something's gone wrong here in Dodge, you know? So I yep. love that that's what you do. Yes. Well, it's, it's so crucial. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, yeah. like I remember back to when I was first learning about vitamins, I used to think it was just like something fun to do. I didn't realize until we got into the weeds of chemistry that those things actually, you know, they're little pieces of the puzzle and all these different pathways and the processes in the body, and they actually do something. And if we think that we're doing well, because we're, you know, eating this and that and the other thing, but we kind of don't like this other, maybe we're not getting this really important cofactor of mineral minerals, especially I think in, in what I do in helping bodies to detox, it really takes a lot of minerals. We need to, and minerals are like the little missing Jenga pieces, you know, and everything comes toppling down without them. We really have to be careful with, as we encourage the cells to detox the body, to detox that we replete the minerals. So we don't end up kind of hurting ourselves or kind of shooting ourselves in the foot or spinning our wheel, so to speak, you know? So, yeah, I love, I love that. That's what you do. Well, that was such a great conversation. What it really was. I will add one thing. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask you, what else do you want to share that we, that we want to make sure that we tell everybody? Yeah. I want to make sure that I tell everybody that you were just talking about, you you just set off a little, you know, alarm in my brain, we are talking about detoxing. And I want to talk about how important it is to do that bef- well before you want to conceive a child. There is yeah. no detoxing while you are pregnant or yeah. potentially pregnant. So this is why I tell people you want to allow like three to six months at a minimum, depending on what we find your levels of toxins or your level of gut health is we want to have time to really create that optimal environment because this is your legacy that you're passing on to not just your children their children their children so it really really matters yeah now I'm I'm reminded I'm thinking today just today I had two different patients charts that I was looking at one was someone who he's a teenager And mom was undergoing Lyme treatment while she was pregnant. She didn't know she was pregnant. And so he was born with Lyme because they didn't know back then that it could be passed on. And so, you know, he kind of started off behind the eight ball and has, you know, had we known then what we know now, things might have been different, not quite so difficult for him. But the other person I'm thinking of had autoimmune, a really kind of real mysterious autoimmune for a while that was all stimulated by chronic mold exposure in her work environment. And we had to deal with all of that before she could start talking fertility. Cause she was in, she was approaching her 42nd birthday and she's like, I'm running out of time. And I'm like, we're so close. We're so close. Well, she just messaged me today and sent me a picture of her six month old baby. So it was a beautiful ending to that story. Oh, baby. Oh, I mean, she is just, just precious and such a gift to, I was making me cry because I just have walked through this with her for the last couple of years. So the mommy is beautiful. The baby is beautiful. The hap- I mean, it's just a happy ending to what could have been really disappointing and tragic. To your point though, working on getting, you know, dealing with infections, dealing with those exposures, things that we, you know, and detoxing the body and taking care of all that. Was that person hundred percent better? No, but we optimized her to the point that it was safe for her to then conceive. And then all through her pregnancy, we just watched, we gave her some nutrition here and there and just supported the baby's nervous system and, and deal and, and growing her mic at the same time. So that when she was able to have the baby, everything was beautiful. And she was able to give the baby everything that she needed and it's such a beautiful beautiful story beautiful ending so it is well done love it yeah thank you well I really appreciated our conversation I I just love talking all things functional medicine and integrative health and I love exploring areas that you know is not my field of expertise and learning more about what other people do and I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. So thank you so much. Do you want to share your information in case people are watching or interested in contacting you? 
Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I made it really easy. You can see like my Zoom name is Dr. Carmel, all spelled out. And my website is all one word, drcarmel.com. Awesome. Simple, awesome. Easy. We'll go to drcarmel.com and she's a beautiful, beautiful person. And we'll be happy to walk through this journey with you and see wonderful results, just like so many of her patients have over the years. So really appreciate it.